So, um, there's a war taking place out there. There's a serious battlefield and there are two camps. On the one side, we've got governments and tax authorities, and on the other side, we've got taxpayers. Um, I'm going to take you, along with Sonal, on a whistle-stop tour of the major issues that are currently taking place in international tax. The first one is something called base erosion and profit shifting, which is an OECD initiative. And the best way to explain this is to talk about some of the usual suspects. And before I tell you what some of them are doing, I think it's worth pointing out that not, none of them are doing anything illegal. What they're doing is using the existing international tax framework to ensure that their profits are taxed at the lowest rate possible. Well, that's just sensible tax planning. The morality of it is another issue, and I'm not going to go there. So what are these companies doing, and what exactly is base erosion and profit shifting? Um, let's take Google as one example. Google earned advertising revenue from the UK, but they bill the advertising revenue out of their Irish company. Why do they do that? Because the Irish corporation tax rate is 12.5%. The UK tax rate, corporation tax, is currently 20%. But over the last five or six years, in fact, over the last eight years, it's come down from 30%. So you can appreciate Google make a substantial tax saving simply by building this revenue out of their Irish company because they can. Uh, let's take another one, McDonald's. A little less easy because McDonald's have stores, branches, and that's where revenue is earned. However, what McDonald's have done is they've used intellectual property laws and they've registered their trademarks in countries such as Luxembourg and Switzerland, then getting their companies in the higher tax <coughs> countries to pay royalties to their Swiss and Luxembourg companies, and of course taking advantage of lower tax rates in Switzerland and Luxembourg and other countries as well. And there are many more suspects than just those. So the OECD has launched an attack on base erosion, <coughs> in other words, companies really reducing their, their domestic profit-making basis, and shifting their profits to lower tax countries. And the stated aim of the attack by the OECD is to ensure that tax is being paid where the real economic activity takes place. And to do this, what the OECD have done is they've developed something called a 15-point action plan, which, to which the OECD countries, the G20 countries, which of course includes South Africa, and many other countries as well, have signed up. Now, I don't have time to go through 15 action points, but let me give you three of them which may illustrate what's going on. Oops, how did I do that? Oh, well. uh, the first one is an attack on the digital economy. And this is a recognition of the fact that over the last centuries, tax laws have been written clearly without any forethought that there may be something called the digital economy, which is an economy which is somewhere out there in the, in, in, in the upper air and allows companies to move their profits around. And what the OECD are doing is they're insisting that in terms of digital economy profits, the profits are reported where the real value is created and not simply where the country wants to report the profits. The second item relates to disclosure of aggressive tax avoidance schemes which is becoming mandatory for the countries which are signatory to the, to the OECD initiative. And this is something that we've seen happening in the UK over the last few years. And the third example I'll give you is transfer pricing. Transfer pricing where two companies which are connected, but in two different countries, trade with each other and set the prices relating to those transactions in such a way that the profit is earned more in the higher tax country than the lower. The OECD have developed a raft of tools to attack transfer pricing, and one of those relates to something called country-by-country -country reporting, which I'll come back to in just a moment. So, war is on for the, for the multinationals moving profits around. Um, McDonald's probably can't say I'm loving it any longer, and um, David Cameron, uh, the, the British Prime Minister, said recently in a fairly thinly veiled attack on, on one of the multinationals, he said the multinationals need to wake up and smell the coffee. <laughs> Moving on, uh, let's have a look at transparency or sharing of tax information. Information is the elixir of life 
as far as tax authorities are concerned, because they cannot attack or audit taxpayers without the information. And in international terms, that becomes far more complicated. Looking at the history of where we've got to so far, um, let's have a look at the bronze medal winners. The bronze medal winners are the double tax agreements, which are agreements signed by two countries, of course, and tax information exchange agreements, which again are signed by two countries. Both of these have involved, um, over the time scales as stated, both of these make provision for the exchange of information between the tax authorities in the different countries. But both have a serious flaw. And the flaw is that the information has to be requested and has to be specific. So the UK tax authorities can write to SARS and say, we have reason to believe Graham Bush has a bank account in South Africa. We have reason to believe he's not declaring the income in that account. Please, can you provide information? What the UK tax authorities can't do is say to SARS, by the way, please send us information on all British accounts which are held by South African institutions. Uh, to qualify that statement, they can't ask for that information in terms of those two sets of agreements. But we've evolved and roll forward to 2010, and now we come to the silver medal stuff. And this is FATCA, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, the US initiative. The UK, as is the way, jumped on the bandwagon as well and developed their own version of FATCA. Uh, in US terms, FATCA means foreign bank accounts, foreign to the US, who hold accounts which are in the name of US citizens, residents, green card holders, have to provide that information to the IRS or withhold a 30% withholding tax. The UK FATCA is similar, relates to financial institutions in the Crown dependencies, so Jersey, Guernsey, Isle of Man, and also British overseas territories, uh, BVI, Bermuda, St. Helena, various others. Um, all of these are now having a report to the US or the UK respectively. So we've now got automatic exchange of information, but in a fairly limited way. Coming back to BEPS, and this is where we get into the gold medal stuff, BEPS has now produced something called country-by-country country reporting to avoid, uh, the, the, uh, to avoid countries uh, involved in transfer pricing. And what this involves is uh, multinational groups having to report their global profits, their global tax paid, their global turnover, global levels of capital and various other things to their various tax authorities, but they have to split this up by country. So it's now becoming very clear how much turnover is taking place in which countries, how much profit and how much tax being paid. Who is it exactly who does the reporting? Well, it's multinational groups with the turnover in excess of 750 million euros, which you'll appreciate as very large groups. My own view is that this is going to come down over time and what we see here is very much the thin edge of the wedge. How's the reporting done? The reporting has to be done by the parent company of the group to their own tax authorities who will then share the information with foreign tax authorities. Question mark, how confidential will this information be? Time will tell. So who signed up to this? Um, up to 12th of May, 39 different countries had signed up and South Africa is one of those. There have been a few more since then. Uh, looking closely at that list, you may spot one fairly glaring omission, and that is uh, under you, uh, the United States of America. <laughs> they do tend to go their own way. Further on transparency, what have the UK done recently? I believe an initiative which is going to spread. And they now require UK companies and UK limited <coughs> liability partnerships to record and report what they call people with significant control. This is far more than just the shareholders of the company. These are the people, and it can by definition be more than one, who have real control over companies. So we're looking at anything from shareholders who have more than 25% in the company to people who can control the composition of the board. And it goes right down to people who have influence over, let us say, a trust which is a shareholder of the company. So this is very far-reaching. What these companies have to do is they have to report this twice. Once in their own registers, which are held at the company registered office, and which, of course, the public can have access to if they so wish. 
And the other one, which is far more out there, is this has to be reported to the registrar of companies, the UK registrar of companies. And it's quite possible to pay a fee of a pound and get that information online. So the real movers behind UK companies are now going to be known. And then really we come to the holy grail, the elixir of life, the serious gold medal, and that is the future. Starting from next year, we have the common reporting standard coming in, and this is going to be widespread sharing of information. The common reporting standard will require financial institutions in the countries that sign up to report a whole raft of information on individual accounts, company accounts, trust accounts, foundation accounts, and once again the reporting goes via their own domestic tax authorities to the tax authorities of the country of residence of the individual or, or company. So, the, and the information of course will include all the transactions and all the balances within these particular uh, counts. To date, 80 countries have signed up. The first tranche of companies starts reporting from January next year. And again, you can see South Africa is in that. The second tranche starts reporting in 2018. There are 100 countries signed up to date. Sorry, not signed up to date. And surprise, surprise, one of them is a little country known as the United States of America. I'll hand over to Sondal at this stage. Thank you, Graham. Uh, there's a lot to take away from everything that Graham has just mentioned, and my personal view is that the international tax bill has completely changed, and it will continue to do so. Tax has been in the headlines in a manner few could have foreseen, even a year or two ago. As a result, there are a number of issues to consider for businesses and individuals. I cannot finish this talk without mentioning the most recent scandal, and just when we thought things couldn't get any worse, we have the panel papers. So what is the Panama Papers all about? Records relating to the formation and administration of offshore companies by law firm Bosak Fonseca were actually obtained from an anonymous source by a German newspaper, who then shared it with the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, ICIJ, um, who then shared it with an international, with a large network of international media partners. So, who is Mossack Fonseca? Mossack Fonseca is a law firm based in Panama. Established in 1977, it's the world's fourth largest provider of offshore services. Until the publications of the Panama Papers, it was largely obscure. In fact, it sits at the heart of global offshore industry, acting for about over 200,000 companies. Most of those, or well, more than half of those, were registered in British tax havens, including the UK. Mosfon, as the company styles itself, employs about 600 staff in 42 countries. Its offices sits in the world's leading secrecy jurisdictions, so Cyprus, Luxembourg, Jersey, even the Swiss canton of Zug, to name a few. So the issues uh, that the Panama Papers highlight um, is the necessity to differentiate between tax evasion and non-evasion. Um, Mossack Fonseca actually said that it complied with international protocols to ensure that offshore companies weren't used for money laundering, tax dodging, or any other illicit purposes. The Panama Papers have shown a completely different light to a hidden world the firm says it does not recognize. Um, the reality is, it is a gross exaggeration to say that having or forming an offshore company is illegal. Legislation has evolved over the years considerably. What, your, what was common practice, for example, to own a UK property via an offshore company, was perfectly legal. Um, having holding accounts, having investments offshore is definitely not legal. In fact, most, most individuals used offshore companies for perfectly legitimate purposes and had good commercial rationale to do so. However, these same individuals using these arrangements are lumped with criminals or evaders, however unfair that connection may well be. It is all about what the company is doing. If income is declared in one's country's residence, then there shouldn't really be any issues. If the fee cut type obligation, so for example, your money laundering, your due diligence, you know your client checklist, or wherever relevant exchange control issues have all been complied with, there shouldn't be any issues. In fact, the panel papers were all obtained illegally by hacking, but I guess that's not the focus. <laughs> um, alongside companies that were revealed in the panel papers, it has also came to light that some banks were also involved 
uh, on an industrial scale. So we have HSBC that formed about 2,000 offshore companies, Hoots formed about 500, Barclays about 300, just to name a few. The Panama Papers also revealed, in some way or the other, uh, politicians, celebrities, and the famous. I'm sure you'll all recognize some of these faces on this slide here. So how much data has actually been leaked? Let's have a look at the Panama Papers in numbers. As mentioned before, over 200,000 entities were involved, about 11.5 million documents leaked, 200, over 200 countries involved, 29 Forbes listed billionaires were involved, and about 12 past and present country heads were named. Panel Papers is the biggest leak in history. And we can see from the slide, you know, we've got big leaks, we've got offshore secrets, Luxembourg black tax files, the HSBC files. These are all small in comparison to the size of the Panama Papers. So why the hysteria? Um, Panama Papers and Mossack Fonseca's e leaked emails actually revealed the extraordinary measures some of its well-heel clients took to keep their financial affairs a secret, purely for fears of ransom, kidnapping, or sometimes simply just for inheritance and estate planning purposes. The Panama Papers was a massive blow to secrecy. Whilst most individuals were using such arrangements for perfectly legitimate purposes, there were some that were suspects of claims of fraud and um, tax evasion. I think I came across an article uh, which I was reading just a week ago where uh, one of Mossack Fonseca's Italian clients was revealed in there and uh, it mentioned that the Italian client was under pressure by the fiscal authorities. Um, the fiscal authorities weren't quite convinced that this individual was actually declaring all its income and assets to the extent that they actually looked as to what type of car that individual drove, whether he visited Switzerland frequently. What this individual had done was to form an offshore company in Panama, which then owned a company in Luxembourg, which in turn owned Italian assets. This caused a lot of lack of information on public record in many so-called tax havens. Mossack Fonseca's clients often used nicknames, sometimes even fake email IDs. In fact, it was more more sort of often where Mossack Fonseca actually only really liaises with intermediaries as opposed to the end client. So the most important question was not asked. So for example, what is the source of the funds? That is the most important question which never got asked. In fact, the panel papers revealed that company checks were frequently flawed. So as a result, governments have become very suspicious of such arrangements and hence are being looked into. I think as a result of the Panama Papers, the focus going forward is going to revolve around real substance. The terms transfer pricing, base erosion profit shifting, BEPS, as Graham mentioned earlier, will still have some relevance, but I think more questions like, is there any substance to this transaction? What is the commercial sense of having an offshore company? Those are the kind of questions that I think that are going to be tackled with by individuals, and I think substance will be key going forward. So all in all, the Panama Papers have hastened all global efforts to enhance transparency initiatives. Beneficial ownership at the moment is becoming an increasingly hot topic, and the Panama Papers have only pushed this to the top of the agenda for both UK governments as well as all other global jurisdictions. So about 32 countries have actually signed up for Beneficial Ownership Information Exchange. Um, on the 14th of April, finance ministers from UK, Germany, France, Italy and Spain actually launched a pilot to exchange company beneficial ownership registers as well as new registers for trusts. A week later, 27 other countries signed up. So you can see the focus is all on more greater and more enhanced transparency. Alongside these initiatives, there are other initiatives that are taking that are underway uh, to enhance greater transparency. Um, and one of them that's under consultation at the moment is offshore companies owning properties in the UK will have to reveal who the beneficial owners are, who actually controls those companies. Um, if government plans are approved, the whole idea is to actually maintain a register similar to what Graham mentioned earlier, the PSC, Persons with Significant Control, where they will reveal who the beneficial owners are of these offshore companies. It is also said that it doesn't only just relate to offshore companies wishing to buy UK properties, but also those offshore companies that already have UK properties. Those not wishing to join the register may not be allowed to buy UK properties in the UK. We just have to watch this space. Just to give you a bit of statistics 
About 100,000 properties in England are owned by offshore companies, of which 44,000 properties are actually based in London. And to give this a bit more perspective, uh, 120 billion pounds actually invested in British properties owned by offshore companies. So, going back to the Panama Papers, I mean, it's quite clear that tax is a worldwide problem and it will take a global effort to actually find a practical solution. Panama is taking the lead on this, it is cooperating with the OECD, it will be implementing some of the BEPS initiatives into its legislation. Whilst the Panama Papers dig up the past, it doesn't resolve the future. I think the real challenge will be in imagining the future. What will transparency look like in 2020? While some events come into focus now, like the Panama Papers, and fade away, I'm sure Panama Papers will, you know, will be talked about for the next few months and then be forgotten about. But the general level of interest will always remain high. Um, I think this leaves a lot of food for thought for all of us over here. And I'd just like to finish off with the phrase, there is no place to hide. That's Graham Bush, Sonal Shah, from the UK International Tax Advisors.